Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like Starch. Thanks, Starch. Hello, Penguinauts! I'm the Baby Penguin, and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. A couple of days late, thanks to the start of the university term. I had nine until six lectures today, and here I am at half nine recording the voiceover for you guys. Still, we did manage to hit the anniversary of Sputnik's launch, so I guess there is still some precedent for releasing this episode today. But with the start of uni, you can expect future episodes that hopefully still kind of stick to the schedule. They'll probably slip a few days here and there, but they're probably going to be a lot shorter than today's episode or previous episodes. Expect maybe two to three missions per episode, 15 to 20 minute episodes from here on out. Still, you just saw there the launch of Pocket of 12. We are launching a lot of UR100s uh, this episode, so I'm sort of blasting through them. And we're heading on over to Lunar Cod 1, which is getting up to shenanigans in the Lunar Midlands, completing its rover contract, finally giving us a few hundred thousand funds we are owed from sending this to the moon, because we had to drive this to the far side of the moon, which was our first rover contract. I know the States didn't have to deal with that. Wanderer was able to travel across the near side of the moon, but we had to get a lunar far side communications network set up before we could do this mission. And so that's why I rolled this into the first launch of our N1 Slava launch vehicle in the previous episode. But yes, this is finally completing its contract as it reaches three different areas on the lunar surface. Heading on over to Venera 4, we're sort of jumping all over the solar system in this episode. It is now arriving at Venus, which is the reason I launched it, because this can arrive at Venus and get us a lot of funding and a lot of science well before our crewed lunar landing. So it still can have an impact on the moon race. So it was worth building this mission instead of dedicating a few more days to building N1s because hopefully it should speed up our production lines enough to more than pay for itself. So we're going to be expending the remainder of block D just to get ourselves into a highly eccentric orbit and then we're going to go around for a second orbit and then fire the main thruster which uses UDMH and NTO on the spacecraft bus itself. We're doing it in two passes for efficiency reasons and also for communications reasons. You can actually see Earth there, the pale little blue dot above the horizon and we're not going to be able to maintain communications with it long enough to slow into the desired orbit so I thought I would do it a stage at a time. We're just burning off our remaining high test peroxide as well. We do still use HTP as our reaction control propellant in block day uh, just because otherwise I'd have to retool the stages and everything and I might as well just leave it as it is since it works and uh, we don't really need much performance out of the block day uh, reaction control system. I'm just using UDMH and MTO which is much more expensive to buy and actually handle and integrate on probes that actually need the performance, such as the main bus of Venera 4 itself, which you can see here slowing into a lower orbit of Venus in all of its glory. So once we're in orbit and we've got our Venus Orbital Science Probe contract, we're actually going to leave Venera 4 for a few months and head on back to Earth until its orbit is better aligned with Earth so that we can have full communications with it at all points throughout its orbit. I don't want to make a landing attempt and potentially lose comms with Earth. That would be a little bit tragic. So that's going to be a little later on in the episode. And in the meantime, we are launching Rodna 1. I was told it's not Rodina, it's Rodina. That's how you pronounce it. Regardless, this is the first crude launch of the N1 Slava launch vehicle. And things are already going swimmingly. We immediately have an engine shut down 32 seconds into flight, but we're able to shut down the opposing engine pretty quickly. I practice this a lot in simulations and continue on. We do have a performance loss at 59 seconds and another one at 84 seconds. 
Now, other than that, Block R is performing well. I was right in my hypothesis that test light starts to bite you in the ass on the second launch of any new launch vehicle because uh, that's when the mean time between failures really starts to kick in. As demonstrated when we light the second stage and we suffer not one, not two, but three separate ignition failures at once and none of them are opposite one another so we have to shut down all the opposing engines to regain control of the vehicle and we end up with two remaining engines and yeah there is no way this is reaching orbit i know this now but at the time i was still trying to reach orbit so i thought i would jettison the launch escape system and then see what kind of mass budget we had to work with to see if I had a high enough thrust to weight ratio to maybe fire the third stage and get into orbit using the lunar orbit stage. Unfortunately, while we're still recovering control of the vehicle, I decided to deploy the payload fairing since we've had it a lot longer than we should have and it weighs quite a few tons and unfortunately it doesn't deploy properly and we end up destroying a block of A of the vehicle, very narrowly avoiding hitting the Soyuz against the lower stage. Svetlana and Konstantin were very lucky to get away with their lives here, but the entire launch vehicle completely disintegrates, and they have to brace themselves for a pretty sketchy ballistic re-entry. Yeah, not exactly the result we were hoping for. You'll have noticed actually that the N1 has uh, a new paint scheme. I'm changing the paint scheme each launch in line with the paint schemes that they had in reality. They added more and more white onto the stages to solve some of the thermal issues it had on the pad. And I thought we'd get to see this beautiful new N1, which I spent a while painting, make it all the way to orbit and perform the first low Earth orbit test of the lunar stack. But unfortunately, Rodner 1 is a failure. Although of course we will claim that it did not have crew aboard. They managed to land safely. So we're now changing our research priorities away from space stations onto the upgraded versions of every single engine the N1 uses because yeah it looks like those engines are not going to be reliable enough for us to put crew on them in future. And in the meantime while we're revamping our N1 production line we're launching a few more communication satellites so this is Sphere 25 and it's heading on up into medium earth orbit as with every previous commercial communications mission we really are churning these out in fact i have to actually design a larger launch vehicle the ur200 which you'll see in the next episode because plasetsk is churning out ur100s faster than the contracts can even regenerate at this point moving on we get some news from the commonwealth space commission in australia as caliban one becomes the first uk artificial satellite. Now obviously not particularly impressive we're launching moon rockets this episode although you know maybe not all of them are successful but still they've managed to achieve that on a shoestring budget and within a year of their founding so very very impressive all the same. Heading back on over to Venera 4 its orbit is now aligned with the earth so we have full communication all throughout and now we're going to begin our first landing attempt. Machina 3 failed to reach Venus, so we basically have a clear shot at landing the first probe on another planet here. Now, I have three attempts because, well, I wanted to use the mass budget on the Yaka launch vehicle, and I thought, why not add multiple and see if we can get science from multiple biomes? Unfortunately, our orbit is not ideal right now. We're still in an eccentric orbit. We don't have enough fuel to lower it into a more circular orbit with all the probes aboard. And so the main spacecraft is going to shoot overhead and we're not going to be able to stay in touch with the probe for very long. And that's a problem because we've introduced some rules with regards to Venus because standard RP-1 doesn't really model it particularly well. With Advanced Capsules Materials node, you can have a probe last for one hour on the surface before you have to delete it or range safety it. Now, with every materials node after that, the amount of time you can spend on the surface doubles. So we have lunar exploration 
era material science, or at least we did when we launched this probe, which means we get two hours on the surface and the orbit of the Venera 4 orbiter is much, much longer than that. So I try to get the re-entry profile just such that we would actually end up on the opposite side of the planet to where we first hit the atmosphere. But this is a window of about 100 meters that we have to hit. And despite simulating it to death, I think the angle of attack might have been slightly off. Uh, at least the angle that we spin stabilize the probe around. And as such, we do enter the atmosphere a little bit too steep and we lose contact with the probe before it reaches the surface. It seems the parachute also fails to deploy and it smashes into the surface as well. But as far as we know, we lost contact and we never re-established it. Still, we've got two more attempts, so we're going to spin up the orbiter again and deploy our second probe. We still managed to get a whole bunch of atmospheric science and complete the first atmospheric probe contract, so it's still not a completely bust mission. But this time we have raised the periapsis just a few hundred meters, and we're going to see if we can basically power slide around to the opposite side of the planet. And this also has the added bonus of giving us a lot of time in the upper atmosphere. And there is a lot of science to be had here. We're getting a lot of upgrade points from this mission and the science it's producing. And that is directly speeding up our lunar program. You see a little upgrade point added in the top left there. In fact, from all the contracts we gain from this mission, we end up getting about 2 million funds and 30 KCT upgrade points from science gained alone. So, you know what? I think this mission was worth doing. It's <laughs> quite a shame that Machina 3 didn't manage to reach Venus, but uh, well, not a shame for us. Unfortunately, our plan of power sliding around the upper atmosphere doesn't quite go to plan. Not only do we go a little bit too far and lose comms with the orbiter once again, but thanks to the spin stabilization being a little bit too generous, we aren't actually able to reorient the probe so that the heat shield is facing the correct way in time before the heat gets much too intense and the probe core disintegrates. So currently we're nil for nil, but we have one more probe to try and this time we have just enough delta v in the orbiter that we can actually raise its periapsis so it will spend a lot more time over that part of its orbit which means we can go for a traditional descent try and reach the surface as quickly as possible and then raise the periapsis of the orbiter so it spends a lot more time there and actually slow into a circular orbit once it's above the probe so hopefully we should get a little over a full hour of connectivity before it goes out of range. We have quite limited delta V margins now on the orbiter and I want to make sure I leave it in an orbit that's in low space around Venus because that's where all of the science that we haven't got yet is to be found apart from the orbital perturbation experiment which is still being done by Venera 3 high above Venus. So here we go we're going on a much more aggressive descent trajectory and the final probe the little probe probe that could is going to try and reach Venus's surface and become the first probe to ever return pictures. As I said in the previous episode, a US probe did technically reach the surface, but it lost comms, it had its antenna melt, and it didn't return any pictures. So as far as they know, they lost contact with it and they have no idea whether it reached the surface. So we are essentially going to be the first. Now, we actually managed to survive re-entry just fine and from here on out it's actually a pretty cushy descent. Venus has a really, really thick CO2 atmosphere so we actually slow down enough that we probably could have landed without a parachute but of course I didn't really want to take that risk. You see it ascending through the clouds and then Venus's surface is revealed in all of its desolate glory and we return the first images. Thank you. 
I actually delayed the deployment of the parachute to try and reach the surface as quickly as possible because, well, the orbiter above us isn't slowing down and we want to get as much data from the surface as possible. And once it reaches the surface, it's only going to last two hours. So we really want to get as much out of it as quickly as possible. But sure enough, we touch down gently and then we perform a braking burn with the orbiter above using pretty much all of its remaining propellant and that slows it into an almost 6 million by 6 million meter orbit and that is the exact boundary where the low space biome above Venus actually starts. So once we're in that orbit we then receive transmissions from the probe below and we return the first images of the surface of another planet and that completes our Venus landing contract. We are swimming in funds after this mission. Although we did lose two probes, they work pretty well as atmospheric probes and we still got a lot of science and funds from them. So all in all, I would consider this a success. Unfortunately, we only managed to return about an hour's worth of science data so we don't complete all of our experiments in the time that the orbiter spends above the probe before it perishes. But still, that is a landmark mission, the first probe to set down on another planet. So with the confidence boost gained and the knowledge gained from the last flight of Rodino 1, we're going to launch another N1. Yeah, we're racking up quite a moon rocket launch cadence. The N1 is made of separate structure aluminium tanks. It's actually a very cheap rocket to build compared to the Saturn V, or Catan V, I should say. You'll notice that now it's actually in its all white color scheme, which is the color scheme it was for its third and fourth launches in reality. Again, those thermal issues on the pad, they decided, yeah, you know, it's worth the hit that it takes to Delta V by adding a few tons of white paint. But despite the fact that we haven't even researched the engine upgrades yet, this time the N1 performs flawlessly and we have a clear separation of the launch escape system and the payload fairing as the second stage ignites all eight of its NK-15 V engines and pushes the lunar stack into orbit. Yes, we're on track for a low Earth orbit test of the entire stack. And well, the Americans haven't launched a single other Catan 5 yet. However, they've got a different approach to building them. You see, they're building all three Catan 5s they need to perform all their prerequisite missions and then land on the moon at the same speed. So it's going to be a while before they launch another one, but then as soon as they launch one, they can launch three in like a shotgun blast of missions. So we have a different approach. We have one build queue, which is much, much faster than our other two. I'm not going to spoil what speed it's at. I've been uh, making a point of not showing my build speeds <laughs> and build times to try and keep you all in suspense as to who's going to reach the moon first. But when it comes to testing milestones, we are currently leagues ahead. So we're actually firing the block gate translunar injection stage just for a short burn, just to ignite the engine, get a bit of engine data and push ourselves up into an eccentric orbit. And that's to not only test the stage, but also get the correct orbital parameters for our contract, which is a simple crewed flight with two plus crew members and a couple of maneuvers, which actually suited this mission profile pretty damn well. You can see the new 7K LOK Soyuz in all of its glory as Svetlana and Konstantin wave from aboard their vessel. We actually have a bunch of new science experiments that come along with this new capsule as well. We end up doing ion sensing attitude control, night image intensification, and synoptic terrain photography. We end up spending about four days in the eccentric orbit and then very quickly afterwards we lower our orbit because, well, the crew were flying through the radiation belts repeatedly. That contract doesn't seem to take that into account, which is a little irritating. And then we spend a following two days in a lower, more circular orbit. After which Svetlana practices the spacewalk that's necessary to transfer into the LK lander. We don't have the mass budget for a crew tunnel, so this is actually how the Soviet cosmonauts would have had to get into it. Although they wouldn't have even had the luxury of an EVA jetpack, so these Kerbals don't even know 
they're born. Now, the first thing we're going to do is just double check that we can actually redock these two vehicles. We haven't tested them separately before with crew aboard. So what we're going to do is just turn back around, double check the docking mechanism, and then we're going to actually separate them out quite a bit for a few hours and perform a whole bunch of tests using the LK. Now the LK's engines, the 858 and 859 engines, they did get a little bit of testing on the first N1 launch, but they haven't had a full duration burn. And really we want to get as much engine data as we can before the upcoming lunar landing. It would be a real shame if we had an engine failure a second before touchdown. Now, despite me performing this mission assuming that we did the engines on the lk don't actually have test light support so i had to actually add a config to add engine failure percentages to the engines because it would have been a bit unfair if n9 had an engine failure chance and we didn't but because of that we didn't actually end up getting any engine data on this flight so hopefully n9 will let me add some engine data uh, to the LK engines because I performed this entire flight thinking goodness me these are the most reliable engines in the world and they are actually very reliable engines anyway but uh, yeah they're not as reliable as I thought they were that is infinite reliability because the engines don't have test light support until I added them myself. Anyway we fired the block day translunar maneuvering stage which would also be our descent stage down to the lunar surface and then we briefly fire the main rd858 engine and its associated verniers before we decouple the lander legs as we would do shortly after takeoff and then we're essentially simulating the return to the lunar soyuz now i've made sure that we've got quite a bit of separation and we're just going to practice basically rendezvousing with the LOK. You see there we're firing the backup engine, which is a feature that the American LEM doesn't have, but the American LEM also uses a pressure fed engine, whereas this is a gas generator engine. So it's a little bit more mechanically complex and it does have a bit higher performance as well, but we're still using storable hypergolic propellant. So the chance of an ignition failure or the chance of any kind of engine failure is still vanishingly small. Still, we perform a pretty major full length burn just to very aggressively get back to the LOK for the simple reason that I just wanted an excuse to burn the engine for a really long time. Again, thinking I was collecting engine data. So N9 Plus let me add some engine data to this engine after I added failures because I could have just not mentioned anything and landed on the moon with uh, a perfectly reliable engine. But again, that would not have been remotely fair. Although, yeah, I think we've been suffering from uh, <laughs> engine failures more than our fair share with the N1, but that's the price you pay. It's a much cheaper launch vehicle. It's much, much faster to build. If they were 100% reliable, we would be on the moon by now. I mean, that's that's how crazy cheap to build those things are. Well, we wouldn't be on the moon by now. This would be the lunar orbit test, but we'd be on the moon within this episode which uh, is kind of sobering to think how much of a lead we had over the Americans, which has unfortunately been squandered by a launch failure. But regardless, we're doing one last test of the backup engine, the 859, which only has two ignitions as we approach the LOK. And then I decided to fire both engines at the same time because I realized that we could and uh, we needed a bit more thrust to weight ratio just to slow ourselves down for our final approach. Then you've seen this a million times before. It's a simple docking maneuver, although this is the first time we have, well, docked two vehicles which launch together, which is... Uh, Interesting. Nothing like this mission ever actually happened in reality in the Soviet Union. They did test the LK in low Earth orbit uncrewed, but as far as I'm aware, they never launched any crew in the LOK Soyuz. The next Soyuz iteration was the 7KT, which was used as a ferry vehicle for the Salyut stations, which we are actually researching, but since it uses batteries instead of solar panels, it really needs a Salyut station to go to. So we're not gonna be launching any 7KTs until we actually have stations for them to go to. We also don't have the funds to spare to actually unlock the parts at the moment. So yeah, everything is currently in service of our Luna program. If it doesn't get us to the moon faster, then it gets cut, simple as. Still, Constantine is taking over command 
of the LOK, and he performs the last part of the rendezvous as they come in for a slightly janky docking. The docking port doesn't actually have a crew tunnel. It was a very simple harpoon and grid system just to lock the two craft together to make it a little bit safer for the crew transfer back into the Soyuz. I did actually dock them 180 degrees the wrong way, so Svetlana had to do a slightly longer spacewalk than she should have had to. Uh, the crew hatch was on the wrong side, but still, that's no problem. We're able to transfer over without any issues. Getting a beautiful look of those new Orlan slash Cretchit spacesuits. I haven't made a difference between the two of them. The Orlan spacesuit was the low earth orbit spacesuit. The Cretchit was the variant which was intended for walking on the moon, but they basically look the same. They use the same design heritage. So as far as I'm concerned, they're the same spacesuit. So I haven't modeled them differently. But with Svetlana back inside the Soyuz descent module, we perform our deorbit burn taking care to actually take the LK with us. You never know, I don't want to leave it in orbit and let the Americans get their hands on our technology. I have no idea if that docking system was rated to support the Soyuz actually burning its engine with the LK attached, but uh, regardless, it's now on course for a fiery demise, although it has served us very well on this mission. It was separate from the Soyuz for about 11 hours in total. The lunar mission is going to be about a day on the surface the lk only has life support reserves for about two days but that's that's pushing it and you can't actually make it last any longer it can support one kerbal for a maximum of two days and then the carbon dioxide scrubbers give out so if we want to do any more longer duration lunar missions we will have to not only have a bigger moon rocket probably a hydrolox upper stage n2 rocket or something like that but also an uprated probably two kerbal lk lander which we will hopefully see in future episodes a lot of people have been asking about ur 700s and ur 900s i will absolutely be building those but we don't have the tech or the money to build them at the moment we'll need a whole new launch pad me and nine have introduced some rules with regards to launching ridiculously toxic propellants such as the pentaborane powered ur 700 which i absolutely want to use so we'll probably only use them for launching uncrewed payloads like really massive things like lunar base modules but that's a ways down the line yet still rodana 2 splashes down in the Caspian Sea and we've completed yet another of our lunar landing prerequisite milestones as well as completing our contract which just about pays for the rocket that actually launched the mission. While we're working on our next N1 though, Lunacod 1 stumbles into something on the lunar surface. It looks like an American space probe, and in fact, it is the Mayflower landed in Marcrisium. Landed three hours before Luna 8, which made it the first probe to soft land on the lunar surface. And the two probes get to hang out for a little while, although of course Mayflower ran out of power a long time ago, and it doesn't even have a TV camera even if it did. I still thought this was a pretty funny moment to document. We might pay a visit to some of the surveyor probes that are still operational and have TV cameras <laughs> later on. Perhaps we can write to the last surveyor that sort of toppled over when it landed on the moon. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? But before we get up to any more lunar shenanigans, we are launching Rodana 3. This is the last lunar prerequisite. This is a lunar orbit test of the entire stack. We've proven that the stack is reliable and safe with Rodana 2. All that remains to be seen is if the rocket can actually get it into orbit. Now this is the last N1 we've built without the upgraded engines, but despite that, things actually start going pretty well. We only have a single performance loss on Block R, which historically was the most troublesome part of the M1 rocket, but for us it's been Block B, the second stage, which always seems to have an ignition failure of some kind. The fact that we had a triple ignition failure just blows my mind but the number of engines and high chance of ignition failure I guess made that inevitable. Regardless this time all but two engines managed to ignite. 
<sighs> yeah, double ignition failure this time. Although they are opposite each other, the lowered thrust to weight ratio for some reason causes the payload fairing to impact the upper stage once again. And the rocket disintegrates. <sighs> yep. Launch failure number two. Now, we could easily take one launch failure, two at a pinch, and still stay ahead of the Americans. But if we have one more launch failure, we are going to lose the moon. Things are uncomfortably close right now. And we come very close to killing Pavel and German. Both of them pass out as they're exposed to 13 Gs, which is even higher than the 12 and a half Gs that Rodina 1 had to deal with, which amusingly didn't make Svetlana pass out, but did make Konstantin pass out. I'm sure that was the cause of a few jokes back at Star City. At least they managed to survive their flight and they're going to try again on Rodina 4 later in the year. But in the meantime, we're launching a couple more UR-100s. I did say we're launching a lot of these this episode, so we're just gonna blast through them. This is Svit 26, which successfully reaches orbit. This is a very, very reliable launch vehicle and it really only takes about five minutes to launch one of these into orbit. So it's been one of our largest sources of income. And in the meantime, we unlock those upgraded engines. Yes, we've got the NK-33, the 43, the 39, and the 31, which will be used on stages one to four in that order. We have also unlocked the RD-301, which is a fluorine-powered engine, which will require that toxic propellants launch pad I mentioned earlier to actually fly anything on, but could be interesting. It's got a ridiculously high performance because only an insane person would ever use fluorine as a propellant, but it is very reactive, of course. So yeah, we might use that in a future episode, perhaps as a high performance upper stage on uncrewed payloads. Still, after that, Pogoda 13 reaches orbit successfully, and now it is time for Rodina 4. This N1 has upgraded engines on every single stage. And not only do the new engines have better performance and much better reliability, they also have multiple ignitions. So if any of them shut down early or fail to ignite, we can just light them again, which means the N1 now has the capability to be an extremely reliable workhorse of our moon program. In fact, the only engines on this entire stack that don't have multiple ignitions to some of the stages even having three ignitions is the third stage with the NK-39s. And can you guess which single stage of the entire rocket has an ignition failure? Put your guesses in the comments below. The third stage is about to ignite. And yeah, we lose an engine. The only stage without extra ignitions and an engine fails to ignite. And also, with only four engines and shutting down the opposing engine to regain control of the vehicle after performing multiple backflips, we only have two engines left which don't provide anywhere near enough thrust to actually get us into orbit. The problem is, we can't abort the mission right now. We're traveling way too fast on way too steep a trajectory for our cosmonauts to survive. So all we can do is try and overburn the engines to try and get as close to orbit as we can. We can't fire the upper stage because it has a pretty comparable thrust to weight ratio to this stage. And then, well, you know, we had no chance of reaching the moon whatsoever. There's no real benefit to us going to low Earth orbit rather than heading to the moon. We might as well just abort. Regardless, as soon as we re-enter the atmosphere, I realize we just have to decouple the capsule and prepare for re-entry. We activate descent mode. We have an offset center of mass. We're giving our Kerbals every chance to survive the coming G-forces. The stage behind them explodes. We just about manage to orient the heat shield fast enough before the entry begins, but the G meter starts to rise and the descent is just far, far too steep. It maxes out and unfortunately Pavel and German are killed by the deceleration.
I wanted to end this episode on a triumphant lunar orbit test mission, full steam ahead, all systems go for the moon landing, and instead we're ending it on a tragedy. We haven't lost any cosmonauts in years, so to lose two of them in such a fashion really, really sucks. This genuinely upset me, actually. They were named after Pavel Popovich and German Titov, who were both Vostok cosmonauts in reality. It should have been the first launch of a truly reliable N1. And the fact that the only stage that didn't have relight capability was the one that failed is such a kick in the face. I almost used NK-31s, which are the TLI engines, a single one of them being used on Block G, which does have two ignitions, but it has a lower thrust to weight ratio and it wasn't planned to be used on Block V, that third stage, so I used the single ignition NK-39 and I really wish I hadn't. It will be used in future, of course, along with the improved payload fairing, which you will have seen on launch massively overcompensating, blasting away from the N1 at the speed of light to make sure it never impacts the third stage again. So our next launch of the M1 should be a success, but three out of five N1s exploding is something I'm not sure we can recover from. That's over a million funds down the drain. Months and months of production time wasted and two Kerbals now unfortunately lost their lives. So I don't know. I really don't know. I thought we had the moon landing in the bag, but if all of N9's Trinity missions go perfectly, we may well have just lost the moon. So not a great note to end the episode on, but thank you for watching Penguinauts. I do hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next episode for hopefully a successful lunar orbit stack test and then the final race to putting the first boots on the lunar surface. A massive thank you to my patrons and donators for their generous support and an extra special thank you to the amazing stake Dakota Clark, Olaf Hammerhand, Lady Lagzalot, Madsor, Peter Lushtenetz, Dennis Klomp, Simone67, Scott Milligan, Jesse Smith, Elmac, NX74656 and Starch.